welcome, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone around the world. The chapter 15 is springing up out of the earth. And as always, we like to begin with a short recitation of some of the selected verses in the chapter itself. And I would love it if you guys would please join me in this, if you can see the screen okay. The ground of the three thousand great thousand fold lands of the Saha world began trembling and splitting open and all at once innumerable thousands of millions of bodhisattva mahasattva sprang up out of it these bodhisattvas had golden-hued bodies, the thirty-two marks and immeasurable radiance. Up until then they had all been dwelling in the empty space beneath this Saha world. These bodhisattvas emerged from below upon hearing the sound of Shakyamuni Buddha speaking. Be diligent and single-minded, have no doubt or regret, for the Buddha wisdom is difficult to fathom. Now you must exert the power of your faith and be steadfast in the virtue of forbearance for all of you are about to hear something you have never heard before i now give you my reassurance so you need not doubt or fear So, uh, welcome. The main message of the Lotus Sutra is hope. Ma ji sa zainen, I am ever thinking. I ga ryo shujo, how can I cause living beings to toku nyu mu jo do embark upon the unsurpassable way, soko jo ju bushin, and quickly accomplish embodiment as Buddhas. Almost a year ago, when we began the Lotus Sutra study program, chapter one, part one, our Dharma talk on October 27th, 2020, we really started with this idea that the Lotus Sutra's message is of hope. And we talked about that we are all bodhisattvas in the process of becoming Buddhas. And that was all the first half of the Sutra. Now we get into the second half where we are all Buddhas with no beginning or end, skillfully displaying the phenomenal activity of bodhisattvas becoming Buddhas. This is the original gate, Homan. We express our Buddha nature in this very lifetime through the threefold Buddha nature of reality, wisdom, and awakening activity. Buddhahood is always present, has always been here, and will always be here. Buddha nature is eternal. On a quantum level, it exists outside of time and space. It is timeless, boundless. That this very life is a burning house, is the pure land, the hope that we can and we will heal and live a happy life, and a loving message of equity, inclusion, and engagement to reconcile and unite all the previous approaches of Buddhism, whether it was Hinayana or Mahayana. So. I ask you today to be inspired, to be inspired with what we're going to be talking about and encourage your practice. So as we always start with a chapter is beginning to set the scene. We come now to the heart of the Lotus Sutra, what Nichiren called the one chapter and the two halves. We enter the Homan section or the original gate of the Lotus Sutra. We're halfway through our program. It's a huge deal that we're here today. The latter 14 chapters of the Lotus Sutra, from the 15th chapter, springing up out of the earth, 
to the last chapter, the encouragement of universal sage bodhisattva is referred to as the original gate, meaning the teaching of the original or eternal Buddha. The main theme of this section is replacing the teaching of attainment of awakening for the first time by Shakyamuni Buddha under the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya with the doctrine of the attainment of Buddhahood in the remotest past by the eternal Shakyamuni Buddha. The original gate shows that the Buddha's guidance of sentient beings continues from the remotest or eternal past on into the infinite future. Nichiren Shonen based his teaching concerning the eternal Shakyamuni Buddha on this original gate as the means of saving ordinary people living in the latter age of degeneration. Nichiren considered the one chapter and two halves as the main discourse of the Lotus Sutra compared to all the other sutras that had come previously. He talked about this in the Kanjin Honzon Show, the writings of Nichiren Shonen, volume two, in page 151 and 152. Like chapter 13 and 14, chapter 15 is the setup for chapter 16. 15 encourages us to be diligent in our practice. <clears throat> um, oh, let me just, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> um, let me just quickly scroll up. The Lotus Sutra is said to have seven parables. Leon Herbert's translation has eight, which includes the potter. And one could say nine if you included digging a well, which we talked about in chapter 10. I sometimes think that perhaps 15 and 16 are the greatest parables of all. 16 shows us the fruits of our practice. That Now, the first half of 15 all the existing bodhisattvas who are here listening wanted to spread the teaching of the Lotus Sutra. The important thing about this is that they all came from other worlds. Then Shakyamuni said, no, no need. I already have disciples who have vowed to spread the Lotus Sutra. And the earth shook and opened and up out of the ground came an innumerable number of these bodhisattvas. The important thing to remember here is that these bodhisattvas burst forth from this earth, not another earth. What was also pretty amazing about this is that the descriptions of their appearance are the exact same for a Buddha. They had the 32 marks of the Buddha. They had the golden hued body. So are these bodhisattvas or are they Buddhas? Does it make a difference? We talked about this idea that chapter 15 exerts, exhorts us to be diligent and effort in our practice. This is called energy or virya. All, and then the, chap, the, the sutra says, all of you with a single mind should don the armor of diligence and give rise to firm will for the Tathagata now intends to reveal and proclaim the wisdom of the Buddhas the sovereign and transcendent powers of Buddhas, the lion-like force of Buddhas, and the majesty and authority of the powers of the Buddhas. So this idea of energy and diligence, and this is a funny graphic, or I, sometimes I think it's funny, <laughs> but it's a, you know, it's trying to dig toward the diamond mines and within mere inches, the person gets discouraged and stops and turns around and walks off just as they were about to strike the diamonds of the Myoho. So be diligent and don't give up. Ah, wait, I want to go back to the screen. So chapter, uh, the Threefold Lotus Sutra, chapter 15, talks about this idea of energy, virya, which can also be translated as diligence, effort, or vigor as one of the seven factors that we need to awaken and to express and manifest our own Buddha nature. The seven factors of awakening are mindfulness, investigation of phenomena or curiosity, inquisitiveness, energy, this is what we're talking about now, rapture, bliss, happiness, joy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. So that's the setup 
for chapter 15. Now I want to change gears completely and move toward a metaphorical meaning because I think that the value for me and the practice, my practice deepened so much when I started to look at this as what is this metaphorically telling us? And it starts off with this idea that dwelling in the empty space beneath this Saha world. The Lotus Sutra itself could be considered a koan, a riddle, because all of its verses and prose are mind busting. And it uses metaphor to shock one out of our preconceptions and assumptions, forcing us to see beyond, to see deeper, to see below, to see within what we see with our six senses. And the use of near infinite amounts of distances and time forces us to realize that we can't conceive of or understand this Dharma, this eternal Dharma, this original Dharma, with our mere intellect. Infinite space and distances mean that we are all interconnected with no distances between us. And the previous chapters blew up this idea of space, just completely blew it up with these infinite numbers of worlds and aeons and kalpas. And it was so infinite that it became meaningless because it forces us to realize that that we exist in this moment as a process flow of creation with no beginning, no end in this moment now. So the first thing that these chapters were doing was blowing up this idea that there's any distance and space between us, that we are all interconnected. We are all one. We are united. And then the infinite time and duration starts to get blown up with chapter 15 and chapter 16. Infinite time and duration means there is no time. There is no distant past. There is no future. The moment is a continual process flow state arising from emptiness, emerging from the ground of being. Infinite space and time also indicates the depth dimensions of our lives that we are alienated from. All that resides within our unconscious minds and even the influences of all time and space on our mind-body at this particular point of space-time that we are not consciously aware of or even able to process, but it is there. And we can awaken to its presence and influence it through perhaps not ever to grasp it with our finite idea of selfhood. Remotest past, kuan, signifies not merely an immensely long time ago in linear historical terms, but also carry the meaning of timelessness and thus of the Buddha's constant presence. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote in his book, Open Heart, this idea, the first half of the sutra is all the historical and the latter half is all the ultimate. The ultimate transcends or goes below this idea of time and space. The practice and propagation of the Lotus Sutra in the Mapo era is the juncture where the linear time of ordinary experience and the timeless realm of the Buddha intersect together. In embracing the Daimoku with the same mind as Nichiren, one immediately becomes a disciple of the ever-present, primordial, original, eternal Shakyamuni Buddha and is encompassed in his enlightened realm. That was a quote from Jackie Stone in her book, Two Buddhas Side by Side. And then another quote from... Um, Buddhism for today, Maitreya, the world honored one, has bestowed, oh, excuse me, this is Vimala Kirti Sutra. From the Vimala Kirti Sutra, he's, Vimala Kirti is talking. Maitreya, the world honored one has bestowed on your noble person the prediction that you will achieve Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi in a single lifetime. What lifetime will you use to experience this prediction? Past, future, or present? If a past life, then the past life is already extinguished. If a future life, then the future life has not yet arrived. If the present life, then the present life is non-abiding. It is as the Buddha has explained. O bhikshus, you are in this immediate present, born, aged, and extinguished. That's from chapter 4 of the Vimalakirti Sutra, Bodhisattvas. That's page 97. So, I think someone once asked before, where do we get the idea of the three truths in, in the Lotus Sutra? Now we see that the three truths are in chapter 15, 
16 and 17. And we now in chapter 15 see that the earth or ground represents provisional reality, which exists through cause and effect or dependent origination. And the Dharma arises from the earth or life. Without life, there is no Dharma. Our subconscious, our thoughts, emotions, feelings, sensations arises from deep within us. Other power, other worlds versus self-power. And I wanted to call attention to the previous slide that all the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas had come from other worlds. All the Bodhisattvas of the earth come from this world. These are all our subconscious thoughts and emotions. But what it's really telling us is that you have to do the work yourself. You can't, that no one else can attain enlightenment for you. No one else can save you. No one else can give you salvation. No one else can take care of you. You have to do the work yourself. You have to have the energy of your practice. Chapter 15 is telling us the Buddha nature comes from within, but you have to do the work. And again, in the Vimalakirti Sutra, it says, all sentient beings are the characteristic of Bodhi. So emerging from inside, what does all that mean? Nietzsche wrote in that real aspect of the Gohonzon, never seek this Gohonzon outside yourself. The Gohonzon exists only within the mortal flesh of us ordinary people who embrace the Lotus Sutra and chant Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. To be endowed with the 10 worlds means that all 10, without a single exception, exist in one world. Because of this, it is called a mandala. Mandala is a Sanskrit word that is translated as perfectly endowed or a cluster of blessings. Upon closer inspection, however, this is from the O Mansu Dono Nyobo Gohenji Gosho. Nietzsche wrote, Upon closer inspection, however, it is preached that both hell and the Buddha exist in our five-foot bodies. The Buddha also stays in our minds. It is like the fire that exists within a flint and the fortune that can be found within a gem. We ordinary people cannot see our own eyelashes, which are too close, or the end of the sky, which is too far. Likewise, we are unaware of the Buddha residing in our minds. Chapter 15 introduces all of these bodhisattvas of the earth. They are innumerable. They are uncountable. You know, how did they ever fill up the space, of course? The idea, again, was this mind-busting idea that these numbers were so vast, they became meaningless and forced us to realize that this is all just representative of our states of existence. Now, they also were four leaders of the bodhisattvas of the earth. And I looked to the Ongi Kuden for a really wonderful explanation of these four leaders of the earth and how they are represented on our Gohonzon. The first one was superior practice, Jogyo. Nichiren, of course, we identify with Bodhisattva Jogyo. And symbolically, according to the Ongi Kuden, he, Bodhisattva Jogyo represented fire and then the idea of self. And from Buddhism for today, Nikyo Wanawano um, brought him in as part of our four great bodhisattva vows, which of course we chanted at the end of our service today. The one was Butsu Do Mujo Se Ganjo, which is the way of the Buddha is unsurpassed. I vow to become it. And this is how the, you know, Nichiren was identified with this. And you can see if you have very, <laughs> if you get really close to the screen, you can see that Bodhisattva Jogyo is on Shakyamuni Buddha's right hand side at the top of our mandala in the position of honor. The next Bodhisattva was limitless practice or Muhengyo. And he represented, he, she, excuse me, represented wind or the idea of eternity. And from the Bodhisattva vows, Homan Mujin Se Gan, and that is Dharma gates are inexhaustible. I vow to know them all. And Mohengyo is standing on Jogyo's right alongside with Shakyamuni Buddha at the top. Pure practice, also known as Jogyo, different kanji characters, was the element of water, the idea of purity, and Bono Mushu Se Gandan, 
which was defilements are innumerable. I vow to resolve them all. Defilements, wind blows them away. And now, Jogyo is standing to the left of many treasures, uh, Buddha. And lastly, was steadily established practice, or Anrugyo, and represents the element of earth, or bliss, and the vow of Shujo Muhen Segando, which is sentient beings are infinite, I vow to liberate them all. So the four great bodhisattva vows are connected to these four bodhisattvas. We recite those with every gongyo service. And the four elements thought to make up life are aligned with these. The Dharma is pure. Nirvana is blissful. The Dharma body is eternal. And Buddha nature is self or authenticity. The four virtues of Nirvana or Buddha nature the unconditioned are purity, bliss, eternity, and authenticity. The opposite of conditioned phenomena, which are impure, suffering, impermanent, and non-self. In the preliminary practice of mindfulness, according to Tian Tai, one meditates upon the impurity of form, the suffering of feelings, the impermanence of mental states, and the non-selfhood of all phenomena, dharmas, lowercase d, and then one realizes that impurity, suffering, impermanence, and non-self all apply to each of the four foundations of form, feelings, mental states, and phenomena. The unconditioned, however, being freedom from the conditioned, must therefore be pure, blissful, eternal, and authentic. This is in line with the four seals of the Dharma, which were the three marks of impermanence, suffering, non-self, which characterize all phenomena, and the addition of the perfect peace of nirvana. From the Ongi Kudin, Nichiren wrote, this is a really important passage about these four bodhisattvas, so please listen carefully. Nichiren, Nichiren um, spoke and Nikko uh, wrote down, quote, in explaining the identity of the four great bodhisattvas described here, volume nine of the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra, Described in the Lotus Sutra passage here represent the four virtues. Superior practice represents the virtue of true self. Boundless practice represents the virtue of eternity. Pure practice represents the virtue of purity. Firmly established practice represents the virtue of happiness. There are times when a single person possesses all four of these principles. So now Nietzsche and himself is saying that these are principles that a single person possesses inside them. So he's alluding that these aren't real people that sprang up out of the earth. These are things that come forth from your own inside, your own subconscious, that you too have these elements of the four bodhisattvas of the earth. Continuing on, quote, to transcend the two types of death is known as superior practices to go beyond the two opposing views that life is cut off after existence or that it is eternally the same is called boundless practices. Because one overcomes illusions and attachments, that state is designated pure practice. And because one is as perfect in virtue as the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, that state is named firmly established practices. And I pause to repeat, Nietzsche is now saying that if one is perfect in their virtue, they are the same as the Buddha. We are Buddhas in the process. We are bodhisattvas in the process of becoming Buddhas. This is so powerful. Continuing on. Firmly established practices. Again, one may say that fire is that which burns things, and hence it corresponds to superior practices. Water is that which purifies things, and hence it corresponds to pure practices. Wind is that which blows away dust and grime, delusions and attachments, and thus corresponds to boundless practices. The great earth is that which nourishes plants and trees and corresponds to firmly established practices. These are respective merits of the four bodhisattvas. Though the practices of the four bodhisattvas differ from one another, all are in effect contained in the practice of chanting namu myoho renge kyo. So this is another another graphic just to keep keep us <laughs> keep us from getting too serious. 
this idea of springing up from the earth, imagining that there is water in the aquifers underneath the ground and we need to drill, dig wells like the parable we talked about digging the well in chapter 10. The omnipresent eternal Buddha is always present within and around us. The water of the Buddha is always there whether we see it or not. We must dig the well and we should not stop until we hit the water. Only when we cap the well with the three poisons of ignorance, greed, and hatred do we stop or interrupt this flow. Our practice of mindful chanting meditation is what reopens the well, allowing us to be fully liberated from these three poisons of greed, ignorance, and hatred, and to be fully engaged in the world, knowing that we are all interconnected with each other, and we're always connected to the eternal Buddha of all beings, which as you know is my favorite expression in the entire Lotus Sutra, Yui Butsu, Yo Butsu. The Threefold Lotus Sutra, chapter 10, page 12, where it says, For example, Medicine King, suppose an extremely thirsty person is digging for water on a highland plateau. Seeing that the soil is dry, he or she knows that water is still far below. Continuing with his or her efforts, in time he and she sees deep, damp soil and knows at last when they reach mud, they know for certain that water is at hand. And one of our uh, Dharma brothers, Brian McGuire, um, from Connecticut, during Thursday Shodaigyo meditation, uh, right in the middle of, of chanting, had this insight flash came up of a poem, and I loved it, and I really asked, I asked him if I could share it with his permission, and he said, of course, my mind putters about while body and voice are chanting. Pure. Should I rejoin them? Yes, let's. How strange that purity should be everywhere. I might trip over it. So we come to the slide that I really want to um, emphasize is reality right now is the agency of awakening. The earth is the ground of awakening. Shoji Sokonehan, birth and death itself is nirvana. Our afflictions or earthly desires lead us to awakening. One can view the bodhisattvas of the earth as these afflictions becomes reality through causes and conditions that arise as provisional existence, which are in turn the eternal Buddha's skillful means. Arising from deep within, the empty space beneath the ground, emptiness underlying the grounds of advanced bodhisattva practice. So what does chapter 15 mean to you? First of all, have hope. Things in Mapo, the latter age, particularly now with COVID and everything going on, it's easy to lose hope, but please don't. The Buddha guarantees that in chapter 15, all of this is available to us inside our own lives. Have hope. You need look no further than now for hope. You need look no further than within to have hope. You yourself are the agency of awakening for yourself and for the whole world. Awakening emerges from within you. That is the meaning of these bodhisattvas arising from out of the ground. They are coming up out of you and when you express and manifest your Buddha nature, the whole world is healed. You're transformed and you are healed. All your daily activities, even the lifting and lowering of your feet as you go about your day, are the earth and the ground of practice. And as you know, the three great secret dharmas from Nichiren were the Gohonzon, the Odaimoku, and the Kaidan, or place of practice. The place of practice is not some place you go. It is wherever you are. And wherever you are, you express the Gohonzon and the Odaimoku comes up from out of you to transform yourself, to heal yourself, and to heal the world around you. So as we've talked about many times, and I always close on this particular slide, everything that we discuss today is contained in the meditation container of Namu Myo Ho Renge Kyo. Everything we talk about, what I think, what you think, 
together. We're all interconnected. It's all in Myoho Rengekyo. So I ask this question that I ask every time when we conclude the session. Does this make you want to chant more or less? I sincerely hope you do want to chant more. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. May you be peaceful and at ease. This is Shanti.